Thank you for coming. I know it's hard to you know, pay attention for the last talk before lunch, uh, especially on a Friday, so I appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about how you can start strong. When you're starting a new Python project, what are all the different things that you can do to make your, uh, make your life much harder kind of down the line? Because the idea is that today we have so many, so many different tools that can, uh, that can help you with the, with the development process, and that's going to be mostly the focus of this talk. Um, and their purpose is to make things easier, make things smoother, primarily to eliminate kind of the, the unnecessary work, whether it's discussions with your coworkers on, oh, how do you actually format that? What tool do you use for that? What version do you use for that? But also make sure that you're effective and kind of secure in your development that you have things set up so that they help you as opposed to hinder you. Uh, so we're going to be creating like a, together like a template of a project, of an empty project, and uh, uh, putting in all the different tools that we need, uh, not only to, for the, for the uh, Python itself, but also stuff, st things around it. Uh, we're going to be focusing more on building a project, so something that actually uses Python to, to do some things. Uh, we're not that much going to be focusing on creating a library and publishing it to PyPI. We're going to talk a little bit about it at the end, but most of it will still will still apply. Uh, but this is more towards, yeah, I want to I want to create a project. I want to write a website. I want to write some scripts or something like that for myself or for my team, for my company, and I want to I want to run it eventually. Uh, so that's where that's where this is coming from. And so let's start with like a super simple setup, right? You, uh, I assume that you, uh, we're using Git for this for this example, but it will work just as well with other things. And we have uh, we just have four files in one directory. Uh, so we have the sample directory and the under under in it. That's actually our Python code. We created empty, and and that's there. And honestly, that's the that's the core of it, obviously. But every good project should have also a readme and a license. Even if you're doing something for yourself, uh, spend a few minutes, look up a license, even if you just say there, all rights reserved or something along those lines, make sure that there is a license to kind of avoid problems down the line. It's super easy to, to set up. There are m way more qualified people than me to talk about licensing, so I'm going to just carry on. Uh, then readme is obviously the most important part because that's the documentation. And every kind of single step that we're going to talk about here today should end up somewhere in the readme because you should be also documenting about how you work, what, how do you set up the project, how do you manage dependencies, and all of those things. And finally, obviously, don't git ignore. Uh, that's, that's pretty standard so that you don't accidentally commit your PYC file or your virtual end for whatever else you, uh, you have there. Absolutely no nothing surprising there. So let's start kind of adding on our tools. First, we need a way how to kind of install our tools. So that's going to be the first use case on how do we, how do we manage that? How do we de uh, manage our dependencies? Uh, so the dependencies, we have multiple different uh, types. We have the dependency of the project itself, of the code, the libraries, the frameworks that you want to use, but also in a similar vein, it's the tools that you want to use to actually manage that. And obviously, that's going to come first because we haven't yet started writing our code. Uh, so let's start with that. Uh, but first, a little bit about what, what dependencies are. Usually, you have a, a requirement in your mind. Like, yes, I want to use Fast API. And right now, the version of Fast API is 0, 1, 1, 1, something else. So this is really what you as a developer want to have. I want a fast API of that version or something that's compatible with it. Uh, so that's the, that's the operator that you're going to use. That's essentially pretty much the only one that you need to know. That's the tilde equal sign, and that uh, mentions a compatible release. So it's a release that has the same, these two, these two numbers, 0 and 111. And then it can, it can differ on a, on a patch releases. So if there is a new version of Fast API released with a, with a bug fix or something like that, it will, it will still match this and it will, get, it will get applied. So this is your requirement. This is the input. This is what I want for my project. 
but that's really not ideal when it comes to deploying things. There you want to be much more precise. Really, you want something like this. So this is, I want fast API, I want exactly this version, one, uh, 0, 1, 11, 0. And I want one of the packages that matches these, these hashes. That's there for security reasons, so that I know that I'm getting what I ordered. When, when somebody wants to install, install these dependencies and they have a requirements file like this, they know that uh, there hasn't been no damage in the shipment and what they actually ordered uh, from, from PyPI is actually what was, what was delivered. Uh, super important thing to have and not that complicated. But obviously, you don't want to ever do this by hand because it's not only going to be there for your one requirement, but for all of its requirements and so on and so forth. So there comes our first, our first tool where we need to compile this into, uh, the, into the requirements. So from requirements in to requirement.txt. So that's where pip compile comes in. It comes from a package called pip tools because it does what's on the tin, like it does compile the requirements into requirements.txt. There's an alternative implementation, UV, which is written in Rust and it is much faster, so we're gonna use that. It's compatible and it does exactly what we need to do. So how do we manage that part? We need a tool that's called UV, we need to install it. Well, we just create another file, requirements-dev.txt. I notice a few things here. First, it already ends it in txt, it's a different file. I'm not putting it in my requirements.in because I don't need this to run my code. I just, I need this to manage my code, to develop my code. So that's why it's in a separate file. And honestly, I don't much care about the version because this is something that's always gonna be run supervised. This is something that I will be installing myself or other developer working on it and they'll be staring at their screen. So I don't need to be super careful, and honestly, it's not usually worth the hassle of doing the compilation and all of those different things, because then you kind of run into the uh, chicken and the egg problem. Like, I need a tool to compile my dependencies, but my dependencies need to be compiled, and <laughs> no. So for, for uh, re requirements-dev, I prefer to keep it, keep it simple. If your project is more, is more serious, by all means, uh, it's always good to do more and pin, pin the dependencies even here, but that's, I think, one corner that you can, that you can easily cut. And now, so now we have, now we have uh, UV and requirements.txt, we can install it, and then just, and just, then just compile our requirements.in, uh, which is just UV, pip compile, our input. We, we shouldn't forget to generate hashes, that's what we want, that's how we get the, the pretty hashes and it looks sophisticated. And, and we write it into, into the requirement.txt. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. So now we have a way how to, uh, how to manage the dependencies. All we need to do is we need to add it to the requirements.in, run our pip compile, it will generate requirement.txt and we can install that and we can, we can run our code, we can run tests, we can do all of these different things. So, might be time to start writing some code, right? Well, there is a problem. If you ask five developers about how, what's, how a code should look like or what, what's considered good code or nice code or something like that, you get seven different answers. And, and that, is, that is a problem because, not necessarily because any, any of their opinions is wrong, but I and probably you neither don't want to have that discussion. Oh, what formatting should we use? Uh, should we, is it okay if we have like forget an imports or something like that? Do they need, need to be in alphabetical order or should we order them by you know, the length of the line or, or something like that? And those are many problems like that that aren't really that important, but especially some people have a tendency to kind of fixate on that. Uh, so that's why I, I like to automate these things. Obviously just decide, decide for once and then just automate it and you never have to have this discussion again. 
that's kind of the, 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 the topic of this, of this talk. I want to automate it so that I don't have to do it and I don't have to think about it. Uh, whether I, it's me writing alone or whether it's me writing as part of a wider team where we would otherwise need to sync on that and, and doing, doing things like that. No, especially when, when starting a new project, it's super easy. Just decide on one tool and go with it. Uh, so there are different kind of ta uh, tasks that fall into this category of, of these discussions. Uh, so first of them is like linting. Uh, so you want to lint your code, which means uh, look for not necessarily errors in the code, uh, but uh, kind of transgressions against the best practices. So looking for code smell or something like that. Uh, these, are, these are the two most popular uh, tools, Rough and, and Flake 8. Uh, I'm going to be using Rough in my examples, but honestly, it, it really doesn't matter. The point of this is as long as you uh, pick a tool and automate it, uh, it doesn't really matter that much which tool it is there because there are plenty of reasonable tools that do an amazing job. And most of the, the other parts come down to personal preference or strict requirements. For example, rough for really large code bases is much nicer because it's much faster. Uh, and it is more conf configurable in some ways, less in others, etc. Generally, for your common project, when you're, when you're starting, when you're playing uh, around, it doesn't really matter that much. So for linting, we have rough check. Then we have formatting. So uh, not only just check whether the formatting is correct, but if it isn't, actually reformat the code so that it matches PEP8 and any kind of other style guides that you might have. Again, not something that you ever want to do, your, uh, do yourself and not something that you want to spend your time on. When you're talking to your team, uh, team members, you don't want to focus on, oh, you submitted a pull request, but like, could you, could you change this to two lines and could you move this over there, etc.? That's not a productive discussion and, and you've burned valuable time and attention on something that shouldn't matter. As long as it is something that can be understood and resolved by a machine, a machine should do it. That's why you invented them, like, so that we can be lazy and focus on the important stuff. And finally, it's kind of a, a sub-problem um, uh, sub of the formatting is to sort imports, make sure that, that it's consistent, that it's divided according to the PEP8 into the three groups, you know, the standard library, your dependencies, and your own, your own code, just for readability and for consistency so that it also helps with resolving merge conflicts and other things. It's just a nice thing, nice thing to have. And as long as you can automate it and it doesn't actually cost you any brain power to do it, why not? So those are the, those are the three tools. As you can see, it's either Flake 8, Black, and iSort, or Rough all the way. Um, they, sh they are mostly compatible, so if you ever decide to switch from one to another, uh, you, should be, you should be absolutely fine. There might be some changes uh, during the transition, but usually fairly minor, and even for like a medium-sized code base, you can, you can comfortably do it, so don't sweat the decision too much. Just whatever, whatever you find, uh, go with that and see where that gets you. Then there is another part of type checking, which I'm kind of not gonna focus on because I personally don't do that uh, in Python. And, you know, your mileage may vary, but if you're interested in there, there are two main tools that, that do that, which is uh, MyPy and PyWrite, and you can integrate them uh, the same way that you would use the other tools, which is typically starting with something uh, like pre-commit. So pre-commit is a general name for a tool that runs in Git before you commit something. It's like really surprising given the name, right? Um, and it kind of runs some checks, and if any of those checks fails, it will tell you, sorry, no. You, you, have to, you have to fix it before, before, you can, before you can commit. You can also use it for some other things, like for example, um, if you have some auto-generated files or something like that, you can, uh, you can uh, generate them using the pre-commit so that you, you know that your kind of master and the, and the generated one, for example, requirements in, in and requirements of TXT are always in sync, and that's one of the things that we're gonna use it for. Uh, there is also a tool specifically called pre-commit, 
which is a handy little tool for running these standard tools that, that, we're, that we're talking about. And, and there's a huge library out there of configurations and, and tools that you can use. So in our case, it would look something like this. We have some built-in uh, built hooks, like endo file fixer and trailing white space. We just make sure that, oh, sorry about that. Um, that just makes sure that any file that you have won't have any, tr uh, any trailing white space at the end of the line or at the end of the file, just some general bookkeeping. This is, again, something not super important, but it's nice to have it if it doesn't cost you anything, any, any brain power, you should have it because otherwise somebody might open it in an editor and it will reformat the entire file and then you have weird p uh, pull requests where you have unrelated changes, et cetera. Not super pretty. Then we have our, our three rough commands, the rough format to auto format everything, a rough itself for the linting, and a rough select dash i dash fix, that's the, uh, that's the uh, ordering of the imports. And finally, we have, a, a, we have the UV uh, with the pre-commit. So this will actually make sure to generate, uh, uh, generate the requirements of .txt. What you can typically configure for these, for these commit hooks, which in this case it comes already pre-configured, pre is it watches for certain files. So for example, the requirements hook, the last one, which can sometimes take like a few seconds or something like that, and you don't want to wait for it when you don't need to, it will only run if you're actually committing a change to one of the requirements files. So it's, it's, so it's smart that way. And then all you have to do is run pre-commit install, which will, uh, which will add itself into your current Git, uh, Git uh, directory, and you can start using it. And using it is pretty straightforward. You just want to commit your awesome changes, and things yell at you. As in, it's as easy as that. In most cases, for example, the rough format, it will actually change the file. So if you're, if you're okay with it, all you have to do is kind of rerun the command, like do another git add, git commit, and, you, and you're good to go. Uh, this, uh, but for, uh, for other things, it might, be, it might be a little different. In this case, there are just the two, the two formatting options that, that, that blew up and my, and my pip compile. So all I have to do is inspect the changes that, that it did, add them, add them to Git, and do another commit, and I'm done. So very, very straightforward, um, integrates well with your, with your workflow, and you don't have to think about it, because you will actually get, get poked. So that's nice. I'm, my m mind is now free. I don't have to think about formatting issues or anything like that. I can, I can sleep safe. How cool is that? <laughs> um, okay, so now we kind of sort of dealt with the, with the code quality itself or with the code on kind of the, the technical level. So now we need to start running some tests because ultimately we are here to write some code which needs to solve a problem. And we need to check whether it solves the problem and that would be by creating some, creating some tests. So I always tell people to start with a test. Whenever, whenever you create an empty project, add a test in there that, that passes or doesn't pass, it doesn't, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, but make sure that there is a test to begin with. The reason for this is the reason kind of why uh, all I'm saying today should be done before you start coding. It's always easy to add things. If you already have your pre-commit installed, it's easy to add another hook. For example, you start adding some YAML files in there for some configurations or other things. There is a pre-commit hook that will, that will format the YAML for you so you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to do it yourself and it will again be consistent. It's much easier to add it to an existing configuration file than to say, okay, oh, now I need to format YAML, I need to do that, et cetera. No, I, I'm not gonna do that. You want to preempt any situation where you might be tempted to say, oh no, that's too much work for now, that's like a side quest, I, I don't wanna go there right now, I need, I, I'm focusing on solving my problem. So that's why we're doing all of this work up front, and one of that is creating a test, and even, even a fixture. As you can see, I'm using PyTest, which is a uh, testing library for, for Python. It is a Python library, it would go into our requirements.dev, uh, uh, 
so that so that it's uh, so that it can be run there. And uh, I even usually create a fixture so you can see this is a fixture for PyTest. It's kind of like a pre-canned test data, you might uh, you might say. So in this case, it just returns two, and my test adds uh, confirms that two plus two does actually equal four. So super trivial, uh, not really interesting at all, but now I don't have any excuse. If I write some code, I already have a place where I can put the tests for it, and hopefully I will already have the infrastructure in place to run those tests both manually and automatically so that, again, I don't have to think about it. In case you haven't noticed, that's kind of the theme of the talk. Like, I don't want to think about things. I just want machines to do things for me. So this is, this is our current state. We've added a bunch of things. We've added the requirements. We're, we've added the test. So conf test is like a standard for PyTest where it stores the fixtures and any kind of other related configurations or anything like that. We have the one test in my test sample. And we have the pre-comic config. Uh, fairly, fairly straightforward. Again, remember that all of these things should be always added to the readme. Um, if, even if it is just one line. Oh, we use PyTest for testing. Uh, to run it, just install dev dependencies and run PyTest. Uh, even just a line like that will definitely help with anybody who's coming into the project or wants to try it out. And that includes you after two weeks of vacation. Because you forget things. I forget things. That's natural. Because I don't want to think about things. Again, same thing. Uh, so, speaking of, I don't want to think about things. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to do things. Uh, do things manually. Uh, ideally, you want to run tests not only yourself, but also have it be run somewhere else automatically. That's something called continuous integration, often often sh uh, shortened to just CI, and that's something that will run the test somewhere on the server whenever you push changes or whether anybody proposes changes to your code. And it's important for, for these reasons, but also for some that might not be immediately obvious. One of my favorite kind of side effects of having continuous integration is you, have ver you are verifying that your requirements are still valid and that they still make sense. Because let's face it, you're not going to recreate your own virtual environment every time you want to ch do a change or something like that. That's work. That's what we're trying to avoid. That's just busy work that we don't want to do. But occasionally, uh, you might, for example, forget to add something to the requirements. You just install it manually. You just do pip install an awesome library. You use them in your you use awesome library in your code. You use it in your tests. Everything is happy locally. But then you push it, and even when you don't have any other collaborators, continuous integration can still help you because it will say, oh, I don't, I don't have this awesome library that you're talking about, like module not found. You need, to, you need to install it. So you know you need to add it to your requirements.in, uh, have pre-commit generate requirements.txt, push it, and suddenly you're happy. So it verifies your, your setup, kind of your bootstrapping process. Uh, my example here is with GitHub Actions, again, kind of the most common thing, but any kind of uh, uh, CI system will, uh, will do. And again, it's not super complicated. Uh, this is a test that, um, uh, a pipeline that does two tests. One is actually run the tests. That's the top one. And the bottom one, you can see that I'm running the pre-commit. Because I have pre-commit. I have a thing, a tool that checks for a bunch of things. It would be a shame not to, not to run it in the CI as well. And I can actually run it on all the files. So not just the files that, are, that, are, that have been changed recently in the last commit or in the last push or whatever, but uh, all the files so that I know that everything still fits together. It's not definitely something that I want to be running locally because it might take some time and I don't want to stop and wait for it. But once I have something like a CI, again, it's easy to add stuff, add stuff to it. So, and you can see it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just install your requirements, you run your tests. In the case of pre-commit, there's already like a packaged action that you just use. All, you need to, all it needs is a Python. Again, pre-packaged uh, action to do that. So pretty straightforward. And there is no reason to not have this as part, of your, as part of your project from the very beginning. Because it's there. And also notice it doesn't even 
I'll reference the name of the project. You can be reusing this file very easily. One more extra step that you can kind of uh, go is uh, pre-configure editor, especially when you're working with a team and you, you're kind of using the same tool. Uh, uh, for example, if you're using if you're using VS Code, you can actually add something like something like this to your uh, to your repo. Uh, so that would be your your settings.json for for VS Code, and this actually tells VS Code that yes, this is a Python project. I'm using rough for formatting. I'm using PyTest for tests. And that way, when, you, when somebody opens this in, in VS Code, they can just click Run Tests, and it will run the tests. And that's kind of cool. Uh, you can also create another file that's called launch.json, where you can add configuration uh, like how to debug the tests, or even like how to run a dev server if you're, let's say, doing a fast API project or a Django project or something like that. So it can tell VS Code, oh, yes, you can do Python Manage UI Run Server, and if you've run it with your debugger, you, you can then start, start debugging things. And because this is common for the project, you can just uh, push it in there and, and have it there shared by everybody else. So this is our final result. Uh, since the last time we saw it, we added the .github and .vs, uh, VS Code directories, but otherwise it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty standard. And uh, it should do everything that we, that we need it to do. So finally, what happens if we want to then take this and publish it to PyPI, if we want to create this into a full-blown full package that we want to distribute? So first we need to kind of replace or uh, augment the requirements of infile with PyProjectTOML. There are, again, much better experts to talk about that, or uh, PyPA, which is the, uh, the project that kind of maintains uh, the packaging infrastructure. They have a sample project specifically for this, uh, so that is, that is a great resource. What's also important not to forget is contributing.md. If you followed what I've, been, what I've been saying, you should have most of those important things in your readme, uh, but it's nice sometimes to be a little bit more explicit and add instructions on how to get involved especially if your code is open source, but even if you're just, you're just doing it inside your company, it's still nice to have that. You might even include things like a, a template for GitHub issues or pull request, et cetera. And finally, when you're doing this as a library, you want to be a little bit more uh, careful about testing and testing, for example, multiple different Python versions or testing different versions of your dependencies and libraries. Uh, what I like to do is sometimes uh, just run the, the uh, from the pip tools package, uh, run the pip compile with that dash upgrade. So it'll try to find the latest version of the soft uh, of the dependency software to make sure that my code still works with them. So if there is a if there is a release, uh, I uh, my my code wouldn't get my code wouldn't get broken, and I'm kind of prepared for the future to migrate to the next path. And that's pretty much it from my side. So uh, if, we have, if we have any questions about how to get, how to get set up so, so that you don't have to think, uh, please ask away. Thank you. We have a microphone in the middle, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk, it was great, really interesting. Just one question about pre-commit. Is it like a hook or is it like a library that you install it? And is it possible to, if it's not a hook, is it possible to configure it in a git hook? So, um, so it, is a, it is a tool that kind of, in, in, uh, that you in, install, that you, so you install it either in your system or you put it in your requirements uh, dash dev because it is a Python tool so you can install it with pip. And then you do the, uh, the pre-commit install, and it creates a script in your .git directory that actually runs, runs these hooks. So it's, it's, a, it's a functionality that's supported by git, and this just like adds, adds itself in there. Okay, so it automatically makes like a pre-hook whenever you do git commit, then Exactly, it yes. Okay, thank you. That's a functionality of, of, of git itself, so this just like is an implementation of that. Cool, thanks. It's, it's not a question, rather a comment on this uh, formatting and linting because I had learned it a few years ago from a very experienced uh, lead developer slash architect in our team. 
that it saves them a tremendous amount of time if you can share these configurations within your team and get everybody working on this. And that's what most people don't think when, especially when the guy spent more than one sprint, you know, creating these, sharing them, and educating the team on how to use because he had to work with remote developers, contractors, etc. Especially when your people are changing in the team, so it's very useful. Thank you. Thank Validation you. is always great. Thank you for your questions and thank you a lot for your talk, Konza. Um, unfortunately, we have no more time for other questions, but please feel free to contact Konza via Discord. Thank you again for your talk. Thank you.